Hi, I'm Zach with HKN. Um, today, um, well, we're going to be making some videos about uh, communications theory classes, or um, you know, digital and analog communications classes. And we use we use a lot of concepts from signals and systems. Um, so I figured I'd go over maybe the the Fourier transform just a little bit conceptually, um, so we can refer to it in videos in the future without you know, without having to explain it a lot. Um, so, well, we have a we have a Fourier transform. We know that it transforms a a time signal to a frequency domain representation. Um, and the inverse Fourier transform would do the opposite. Um, it would transform a well. Here, here's the formula. This would be our um, frequency domain representation of a signal, and this transform would transform form it back to um, time. Um, I decided to start with inverse because it's a, I think it's a little easier to visualize what the, what the transform actually is with the inverse. So, um, so first of all, I guess we, we're working with, uh, in a c complex domain. I, guess, uh, I technically this should be called the inverse, uh, exponential Fourier transform. Uh, that's the most common, um, one to use because it's the most flexible and I guess maybe we'll just start and see why that is. So we know in a, we have a typical way of writing out our complex domain. We have a, we set up a real axis and what we call an imaginary axis. And we can represent numbers in this plane. Um, we represent complex numbers in this plane. We can give numbers a real part and an imaginary part. Um, so what are the properties of this that might be interesting to us? Okay, actually, maybe this is, this is a really cool property. Everyone talks about this. We've seen this. How does it go? It goes e to the, um, okay. We're going to call the unit complex number j because we're doing electrical engineering videos. A lot of people would call it i, but we call current i, so we just call it j. Um, we could have one. Negative one, um, and we've seen that e to the j pi is equal to negative one. Is that right? Yep. Okay, um, and that and that's cool because it's like a I don't know. It's a it's a nice uh, it in, it involves interesting numbers and stuff. But what does that actually mean? So what we're saying is that e to the j pi in this domain would be a point at negative one here. It would be that point there. So, that, but that doesn't really tell us the whole story. the The real idea is that um, e. This implies e to the j any number. Um, we'll call it theta, is actually equal to a. I guess you could think of it as a vector in this domain, with a magnitude of one and a phase of theta. So. What that's saying is that, let's say we picked theta to be pi over 4. Um, and let's try to find e to the j pi over 4 in, in here. What we're saying, we're claiming, is that, so we could draw a unit circle in this domain poorly. What we're saying is, um, as an example, e to the j pi over 4 would be equal to a vector in this domain with magnitude 1 and a angle of pi over 4 radians. Where is that? That would be right up in here. So that's interesting because we can, instead of plugging in this value theta here, um, let's do another example. What would e to the j omega t, where OK, so now we threw a value for time in there. And we're also throwing a, a, an omega, which is radians per second. So radians per second times seconds would be radians, right? So we can treat this omega t argument as our theta, right? And what would this be? This would be, well, it would be equal to a vector length 1 with a phase of omega t. And now if we vary t, um, if we let t go from you know zero to infinity, what that would look like is a a vector in this space rotating in this space with 
you know, angular speed omega. Okay, so that's that's pretty interesting. As time goes on, now um, if we threw a little negative sign up here instead, we throw a negative sign in there, and that would be a vector rotating in this space with a. That's what a negative frequency would be, sort of. You could think of as um, a vector rotating in the uh, clockwise direction. That we pick this direction arbitrarily to be to be positive. Okay, so if omega t is positive, we'd get a vector rotating that way. If omega t is negative, other way. Okay, so um, that's that's good for that's just a, sort of a background. Now I'm going to erase this, and we're going to deal with a an actual Fourier transform. Let's say that we have some Fourier transform x of omega, and we're going to plot it. Okay, so usually when you know your teacher gives you a Fourier transform, there's there's basically two. There's two, you could think of them as dimensions. There's two pieces of information in a Fourier transform. We have our magnitude and we have a phase. So let's say that we're given a Fourier transform um, and we'll plot its magnitude and its phase separately for now. We're going to say that the magnitude of x of omega could be plotted by, um, remember it would be on the omega axis, we'd have a, uh, okay, um, well, we'll get to this later, but any real signal is going to have a Fourier transform, or any real time signal is going to have a Fourier transform that's um, whose magnitude is symmetric about zero. So let's, let's say this, this just happens to be our magnitude. Let's say it has height A, it doesn't really matter. And we're symmetric about zero, so we'd go from negative. I don't know, some number b to the same number positive. So this could be our magnitude. And let's say we are also given a plot for the phase. Call it phase of x omega. Say we, we were given, so that would be also on the omega axis, right? Um, and we see that the magnitude of this outside of you know, b, negative b, it's, it's zero. And it's, so it's kind of pointless to talk about the phase of a, uh, of a zero value. It gets weird when you think about it. But um, OK, so basically, the phase plot would be in the same range, b to negative, or negative b to b. And let's see, let's start out, let's say that at negative b, our Fourier transform had a plot, I mean, a uh, phase of pi over 2 in that it went just linearly to negative pi over 2 at b. That would look something like this. Like that. Okay. So, I mean, this is how you'd usually see it, um, the information represented about a Fourier transform. Um, but it's a little, I mean, maybe you, can, maybe you can totally work from this. But it's a little, I'd like to go one step further to try to visualize what exactly is going on. So if we notice, we have uh, the common omega axis to both these plots. Um, and we can also, we know that these are really complex numbers. We're, ma we're plotting the magnitude of a complex number and the phase of a complex number on, a different, um, on two different plots. But what could we do? We have a domain here that we can plot complex numbers in, um, in the same plane, right? And we can imagine things in three dimensions. So let's. Let's take this, this domain, the real imaginary domain, and then put it um, perpendicular to it an omega axis. Um, this, this is where this starts getting hard to visualize, but I'm going to try to do my best to draw it out in a reasonable way. OK. So imagine this omega axis comes, imagine this is coming straight in and out of the board, and we're just kind of, we kind of have a different viewpoint on it. Now, let's also, well, we're going to take this and we're going to just rotate it 90 degrees for convenience so our, our real axis sticks up. Whoops. So we got real axis and our imaginary axis would sit here. OK, and then we're going to go ahead and try to, it's ambitious, but we're going to try to plot this information all in this one plot. So. We have our common omega axis. It's good. 
And then we're going to try to plot these magnitudes and these phases all along here. So, well, oh, okay, we're going to call this the zero point of the omega two. Um, so we would we know we would start out at you know negative b over here in omega, and we're going to end up coming up to positive b. And we know that, okay, so we know that the magnitude of these values stays constant in between here and there, but we know that um, the phase here starts out at pi over 2 and goes to negative pi over 2. So where is pi over 2 in this domain? Pi over 2 would correspond to a, a vector, right, with um, angle pi over 2 radians, or 90 degrees. So it would be on the imag positive imaginary axis. So that's where we'd start. And it would have, this would be height, it would be height A on the imaginary axis, so it would be J A, right? And then we would linearly go through the phase um, from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2. And somehow over here at B, we end up at, with an angle of negative pi over 2 or a vector of negative J A. OK, and then in between these points, we maintain a constant, we maintain a constant amplitude. Yep. But we just change phase. So I've, it's a little risky, but I'm going to try to draw that out for you, um, what kind of the contour of this would look like. Let's say that, yeah, let's try to use a different color. So. Uh, We'd also, OK, yeah, we know that at 0, we have a phase of 0, right? So we'd have, it would be entirely real at 0 with magnitude A. That's important. So really, this is kind of like a spiral in 3D space, right? Um, so our, our plot of the amplitude and f along with phase would have to kind of start here and go through A and then maybe taper like that. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a good drawing, I guess, <laughs> um, where, so you can imagine splitting this up into a bunch of like incre uh, infinitesimally narrow d omegas, right? Um, and they all have these phases here. Same thing over here. Kind of. OK. And then, so that's our Fourier transform all in one plot, OK? And then we're, let's try to do the inverse Fourier transform with it and see if we can kind of visualize what's going on. So. All these little lines I drew would be x of omega times d omega. D omega. OK, so these, the infinitesimally narrow spots would be d omegas. And we're multiplying them by the magnitude of the, the magnitude and phase of the Fourier transform at that point. And then we have this little extra term in here. We say, let's multiply all these little um, vectors, I guess you can think of them as, by, or phasers, better term. Let's multiply all these little phasors by e to the j omega t. Um, OK. So what, yeah, so what would that do? What that would actually end up doing is, if you can picture this, I, unfortunately we can't like, um, potentially we could find some, some way to simulate it. But if you could imagine all these as little individual vectors and multiply them by this phaser, one of these phasors that spins with time. Um, and clearly, we're going up the omega axis, right? So omega is getting larger. So basically, what we're claiming is that the, the vectors out here, or the phasers out here, would spin faster than the phasers in here, right? So we go along the omega axis. We let time be any value, right? And then we multiply by this phasor spinning, and then we add all the values together. We integrate along this omega axis. We just sum all these little tiny phasors together. And what we actually end up getting for any value of t, what that does is it gives us, it projects onto the real axis the value of x of t at that, that time. It, like I said, it's hard to visualize. Um, and, and I wish we had a, a better way of um, kind of running it. But, but that's what's happening here. So. Um, let's see if we can maybe reason about some properties real quick of the Fourier transform. So we know that it has to be symmetric in magnitude. And well, 
I guess this would be even in magnitude and odd in phase. And why is that? That's because um, imagine, OK, so like I said, these little vectors here would be spinning faster the farther out along the omega axis we get. And what would happen the farther negative on the omega axis we get? They spin faster, but just in the opposite direction, right? So if we pick any, if we pick some value, let's call it just like omega i, um, let's pick the same value on the negative side, negative omega i. Now we know in that sum, remember we summed over all these vectors. So we know that both of these are going to show up. And let's just, yeah, let's just redraw it. So in our, in our real imaginary domain, if we have a vector at positive omega i, we have it rotating omega i. And we have one at also rotating at negative omega i. They, they better have the same magnitude and, and phase if we want them to add into a real value, right? If one of these was, if this one was a lot longer than if the, yeah, if the magnitude for negative omega i was a lot longer, we'd end up, when we added these, remember we're summing them all together, integrating them, we'd end up with some imaginary value. That would give us a, an imaginary valued signal in time, and that's, yeah, it doesn't really happen. So that's why we get these properties here. Um, we need opposite phases for opposite frequencies, and we need the same amplitude. Um, so that's, that, yeah, I guess that's, that's as much as I'll get into it today. But I hope this helped a little bit to visualize what's going on. And, and we could do much the same thing with the Fourier transform. This is the inverse Fourier transform. We're saying take this Fourier transform, find a signal in time. Um, it's a little harder to visualize, though, I think, with the, the, the Fourier transform, the forward transform. But, um, it's basically, we're basically doing roughly the same thing. Um, so, yeah, so I hope that helped a little bit. We will be back next week.